Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his dialogue, The Apology, Socrates is on trial for his life, and he is trying to explain his own position, why it is that he's doing the things that he's doing, and why people would, would be misinterpreting what he's doing as something that would be bad for the, the people of Athens, in particular for the youth of Athens. And like the Blues Brothers, this is going to be kind of a, a silly reference, one of the things that he says is, I'm on a mission from God. And that takes up a good portion of his, his actual defense. So what does this actually mean? Why did it come about that way? What is Socrates talking about with, with you know, saying this as, as a defense? He starts out by telling us a story about this friend of his as, as a young man, when Socrates himself is fairly young, uh, Chirophon. And he says that Chirophon goes to the Oracle at Delphi, and the Oracle at Delphi for the ancient Greeks was one of the several places where you could go to consult a, uh, a representative of the god. And in this case, you have uh, a priestess. I'm not going to go into any great details about this. And you'd have some sort of you know question usually that's being given, and then you'd have some sort of strange, often murky or mysterious response, and, you know, some of the famous question answers that happened are, you know, uh, when, when Croesus asks, uh, should I make war on Cyrus of Persia, and he receives the answer, if you do, a great empire shall be destroyed, he doesn't actually know that it's his own empire. So the god is, is quite often, and they would say the god, Hotheos, um, in this case Apollo, is giving answers that are often enigmatic, that is, mysterious. Enigma is actually the word for, for uh, riddle or, or mystery. And it's up to the person who receives the answer to try to figure out what, what does the God actually mean? What is this guidance that's being provided? In this case, it's not Socrates himself who is asking the God, it's somebody asking on his behalf, and it sets into a, a, a effect a course a whole chain of events that eventually are going to lead to Socrates' trial and imprisonment and death. So, Chirophon goes and he asks a kind of smart-ass question. He says, is anybody wiser than Socrates? And they get a one-word answer, nope. Nobody's wiser than Socrates. So Socrates thinks about this and he says, well, what does that mean? I mean, I don't consider myself particularly wise, and there's all sorts of people in my culture, and I talked about this in, in another one of the core concepts, uh, you know, for example, the politicians, the people in charge of the city who are saying, I actually know what, what uh, the city of Athens needs, what will be beneficial to her in the future, how to avoid that which will be harmful. The poets, the ones who are passing down knowledge and wisdom culturally, and the craftspeople, the people who seem to actually know how to make some particular thing happen, whether it's, you know, retail sales to uh, pottery to shoemaking to organizing households. Socrates thinks to himself, man, I don't know any of this sort of stuff, and yet nobody's wiser than me. So what does the God mean? And this is going to lead, like I put here, to doing philosophy. And philosophy, at least in the way that Plato is depicting it with respect to Socrates and the way that Socrates appears to have understood it, is both an attempt to figure out in his particular case, in his, you might say, existential condition, what Apollo or what the, the oracle means. He says the god can't lie. 
So there must be some sort of truth involved in this, but I have no idea what it, what it actually is. Philosophy then would be the process of trying to figure out what that, what that truth really is. And it's not, you know, a purely academic practice. It's something much more on the spot, engaged. It's still involving the intellect. It's still aiming after knowledge or wisdom. Philosophy itself means love of wisdom, desire to have wisdom and affinity with wisdom. Uh, but it doesn't actually make claims, at least with the respect to Socrates, to have, to possess wisdom. And he's not only trying to figure out who has wisdom, he's trying to figure out what is wisdom. Is wisdom an art or skill or science or discipline like the others, like medicine is or chariot driving is or generalship is? Are these even themselves forms of knowledge or or wisdom, or are they something else, like, you know, being successful in a certain way and then kind of cobbling together a knack, which is what he takes rhetoric to be doing in, in other dialogues. So Socrates goes around, and he takes this, this charge from the god to do something that would strike you as a bit counterintuitive. He says, let me see if I can prove the god wrong. Now that's a weird way of respecting the oracle that's given to you by the god, but that's exactly how he describes it. He says, um, I set myself at last with considerable reluctance to check the truth of the oracle in the following way. I went to interview a man with a high reputation for wisdom, because I felt here if anywhere I should succeed in disproving the oracle and pointing out to my divine authority, you said I was the wisest of men, but here is a man wiser than I am. So, you know, it's a weird way of justifying oneself to say, I'm on a mission from God, I'm obeying a, a kind of divine command or divine bidding, uh, uh, you know, carrying out what's in a divine message, and yet Socrates wants to try to disprove that message. He's, he's putting it to the test. He's, he's saying, yeah, there's got to be somebody who's actually wiser than me. Let me ask this guy. Let me ask this guy. And he goes from person to person to person, and I've discussed this in, in another video, so I'm not going to talk about it much here. Uh, as it turns out, all of their pretensions to wisdom or to knowledge turn out to be, for the most part, baseless. It turns out that the craftsmen actually do possess knowledge within their skill area, but that doesn't translate to knowledge in general, in more universal terms. This earns him a lot of enmity. People don't like to be made fools of, particularly when they have high positions, uh, prestige, respect, and what Socrates is doing is undermining their claims to legitimacy, to authority, and to actually know what they're talking about. So this is a dangerous activity, and it gets him in trouble, and this is why he's actually on trial for his life, according to, to uh, his discussion about the older accusers. Now, Socrates sees what he's doing as something like being assigned to a battlefield position. And Socrates himself did, in fact, fight in campaigns as a hoplite, a heavy-armed soldier. Uh, so, it, you know, it makes sense for him to speak in these terms. He's also addressing an audience of people who themselves, many of them, have served in, in war. And so it's a metaphor that, that they can understand. For us, we might think in terms of being assigned a certain difficult task, not necessarily a dangerous task, but a difficult task that requires perseverance to stick to, uh, to resist temptations, to, to cut corners, to, to you know, say, I, I've had enough for, for today, I'm going home, when the work isn't, isn't completely done. So he looks at what, what he's doing as being assigned as if from, from a general on high to the battle lines. And what are the battle lines? those of the philosophical life. Um, here, here's another passage which uh, reflects this. He says, um, The truth of the matter is this, gentlemen, when a man has once taken up his stand, either because it seems best to him or in obedience to orders, there I believe he is bound to remain and face the danger, taking no account of death or anything else before dishonor. So there's, there's some sort of claim. There's a relationship between himself and, and the God and the truth that the God is supposed to be somehow announcing, or the wisdom that the God has, that Socrates feels that he is being responsive to by carrying out this, this dangerous practice of philosophizing, 
uh, which includes going around and, and making enemies of people, enemies in high places. Um, he says, this being so, it would be shocking inconsistency on my part, gentlemen, when the officers who chose to command me as a, when I was assigned my position at Potidaea and Amphim Amphilus, Amphipolis and Delium, I remained at my post like anyone else and faced death. Actually, we know from other dialogues that Socrates not only stayed in the line like everybody else, but that he had a lot more guts than most of the other people. And even on the retreat, when a lot of people were uh, falling into disorder, he maintained order. He actually saved uh, quite a few people. So he says, um, Yet afterward, when God appointed me, as I supposed and believed, to the duty of leading the philosophical life, examining myself and examining others, I were then through fear of death or any other danger to desert my post. And he says, That would indeed be shocking. If you wanted to get me on the charge of atheism, then you would have me. Because I would be, practically speaking, acting as if Maybe if the gods do exist, I'm not going to pay attention to them. I'm not going to, to follow their charge, which has been given to me. Socrates is actually saying, look, I'm doing the opposite of what I'm being charged with. I'm not being impious, impiety. I'm actually being pious. I am responding to a divinely given message and incumbent upon me duty that I didn't ask for, but now I, I've got it. Just like the guy who is stuck out in that you know, remote post holding the pass, um, he, you know, maybe he got the unlucky straw, or maybe he's lucky because he's going to get glory, but it's up to him to hold that position and, and to fight. So that's what Socrates says he's going to do. He's going to continue the good fight. And remember, at the time of the, this dialogue, he's been you know, doing this for, for quite a while. He's an old man. What are his practices that go into this philosophical life? Uh, questioning himself and others, that's one of them. He also mentions the care of the soul. And this is a very important Platonic and Socratic notion uh, that one ought to pay attention not only to one's body, not only to one's possessions, not only to things like you know honor, prestige, uh, power, these are all more or less external. What you really are is a soul, a psuche. And you want to pay as much attention to making sure that that doesn't become corrupted or disordered or out of whack because that's the one thing you're actually going to retain when your body dies, when your possessions are gone or you know passed on to somebody else. That's the you according to the Platonic and, and Socratic way of looking at things. And really the ancient Greek way of looking at things in general. You know, read the Odyssey or the Iliad and you, and you see that sort of thing. So that's a central thing as well. Questioning, care of the soul. Then he has this metaphor of the gadfly. And it's really quite, quite striking, so it's worth reading. He says, um, this doesn't just pertain to myself or to my friends or to the people who are, are close to me. This pertains to the entire political community, the, the, the polis, in this case Athens. He says, um, it is literally true, even though it sounds rather comical, that God has specially appointed me to this city, as though it were a large thoroughbred horse which because of its great size is inclined to be lazy and needs the stimulation of some stinging fly. This is what a gadfly is. It seems to me that God has attached me to this city to perform the office of such a fly and all day long I never cease to settle here, there, and everywhere, rousing, persuading, reproving every one of you. You will not easily find another like me, gentlemen, and if you take my advice you will spare my life. You could kill me with a single slap, but if you do that, you're actually removing from your very midst something that has been given to you as a political community, as a city, as a community of, of values, by the gods themselves, or by the god, Hotheos. So Socrates is, is making a very powerful case here, if you, you know, accept some of his, his premises. He's saying that his activity of philosophy itself is not something that he originally, you know, just, just chose to do because he thought it would be a great thing to go around and question people. 
he's actually carrying out a religious task, a religious duty. It, it remains, you know, for us to think about whether this can be translated into to not necessarily completely universal terms, saying every instance of philosophy is like this, but uh, similarly existential terms, asking, is that what philosophy could be for me? Do, do I have a charge to question myself, to get to know myself, to question others, to, to you know, wonder about whether they actually know what they purport to know, to take care of my own soul and exhort others to take care of their soul and perhaps even to take a role in political, cultural life of saying, mm, I'm not sure if that's the best thing to do. Let's, you know, sting a bit and, and uh, provoke and see if we can't get people to think to question, to try to work out better solutions, to, to perhaps be a little less selfish and self-centered. Now, the last thing that Socrates says, which is really interesting, he says, you know, you might not believe all this. Here's the proof. You want the proof? Look at my poverty. If I really was in it for, say, the money, I'd be rich because I'm extremely successful at going around and asking people questions and deflating people's egos and pretensions and prestige and at getting young people to think about their souls and stuff like that. If that actually was a money-making enterprise, I'd be rolling in it, but I'm not. So obviously I'm not in it for the money. Obviously I'm in it for something else. Some other reason, he says... Um, does it seem natural I should have neglected my own affairs and endured the humiliation of allowing my family to be neglected all these years while I busied myself on your behalf all this time, going like a father or elder brother to see each one of you privately, urging you to set your thoughts on goodness? If I had got any enjoyment from it, or if I had been paid for my good advice, then you could explain it away. You could say, yeah, he's just in it for whatever he's getting out of it. But that's not the case. I'm not actually doing it just because I get a kick out of it. I'm certainly not making any money at it. He says, the witness that I can offer to prove the truth is my poverty. It may seem curious I go around giving advice like this and busying myself, but that's because I am subject to a divine or supernatural charge. This is the defense that Socrates is making for himself. There's a little bit more to say about Socrates, Plato, and religion, not only in this dialogue, but running through the other dialogues, but that's where the crux of his argument, uh, explaining what he's doing as a philosopher, justifying his practices in terms of a divine calling.